All right, it is 3.20. So um, welcome everyone. Um, our next talk is about automating load balancing via predictive analysis by Steven Rosenberg. Um, I'll be sharing a recording on this. So if you notice any issues whatsoever, please reach out in chat and I'll make sure to fix that up. Um, I'll be sharing my screen now. Hi. Steven Rosenberg, and this presentation is on predictive analysis for migration schedulers, also known as automating load balancing and fault tolerance via predictive analysis. This presentation will explore the possibility of using predictive analysis in order to predict when some processes will complete in order to start the migration of mission critical or high priority processes early but the soon to be freed resources will provide performance improvements within a distributed system, such as within a data center or possibly across data centers. Early migration may also include fault tolerance solutions of which there is a growing interest. The ability to migrate processes, whether they are virtual machines, worker nodes, managed by orchestration applications, pods, containers, or other types of processes provides for many options in conjunction with predictive analysis, which we shall discuss shortly. So the topics of uh, discussion will be load balancing, fault tolerance, scheduling, types of solutions, live migration, and predictive analysis. So this is a load balancing example. You can see you have a load balancer. You can see you have process one running on host one, process two running on host two, process three running on host three. And because we only have three hosts, process four will then run on host one, giving an even distribution. And we call this a round robin approach. So load balancing, we have priority based upon urgency even distribution within categories. We can have urgent priority, high priority, neutral priority, low priority, and no priority. And as a simple solution, we can consider when urgent priority or high priority processes need more resources, we can actually bring down the low priority and no priority processes accordingly. And that would give those processes more resources. So fault tolerance, well, what can go wrong? Well, there are many opportunities for a failure. Uh, we have network elements uh, that can fail, hardware and resources that can fail, operating system BIOS and kernel failures, and of course, process failures. So fault tolerance redundancy example, uh, fault redundancy is one way of mitigating against uh, failures and uh, to avoid downtime. Uh, you have two hosts here, a host one, which is the active host currently, and host two, which is currently the passive host. You see you have two storage elements and you have multiple connectivity. And basically what happens is that when host two detects that host one is no longer responding, then it would become the active host. And the problem with this scenario is one cost, and two is latency because it takes time for host two to realize that host one is not active before it becomes active himself. Uh, there's also issues of a split brain. Uh, if somehow both of the processes can communicate with each other, uh, you can have what's called a split brain scenario. So there are many problems with um, this type of redundant solution. So scheduler dispatching concepts. So this is an example of that. Uh, here you have a process eight on a queue uh, waiting to be launched and a process nine on the queue waiting for process eight to be launched so that then it could be launched. Uh, and you can see that we have a free slot on host two and a free slot on host three. So eight could be launched or migrated, if you will, uh, to host two and process nine could be launched or migrated the host three, but what if eight needs two slots? It would need to wait until process five exits 
in order to be launched and migrated to host two. And if it's not very intelligent, uh, process nine will have to wait until process eight is launched. So if we want a better scenario and we want to be more intelligent, we could say, well, okay, let's migrate process five to host three, and then we can do the launching or migration of process eight onto host two. The concept with early migration though, is if we can detect that process five will be exiting within the time it takes for process eight to launch and or migrate, we can start the launching and or migration early. We can then also start the launching or migration of process nine onto host three. So when we're finished, Process five will no longer be running. Process eight will be running on host two and process nine will be running on host three. And that's an example of early migration. So scheduling, the ability to launch processes based upon needed resources, such as monitoring the amount of resources each process utilizes is one example of obtaining that. The types of launching and migration scenarios can be initial launching, as we discussed. Migration for maintenance. If you uh, have to add uh, new hardware to some host, you can migrate all of the processes to another host without bringing down the processes, so that then you can bring down the host and add the hardware you need. Uh, resource rebalancing, uh, migrating from one host to another, uh, where another host has more resources so that the processes can run more efficiently. And also we have fault recovery, uh, migrating to mitigate system and or process failures. So policy units and the attributes of scheduling migration. So first we have filters. Uh, if a process that needs to be migrated needs a certain piece of hardware, those hosts that do not have those hardware will be filtered out and the rest of the candidates so that have that hardware uh, can then be weighted and scored based upon the load balancer. For example, for even distribution, uh, hosts that have more resources will have higher scores. For power saving, those hosts that use less energy will have higher scores. We also have prioritizing, uh, which we discussed, uh, affinity, CPU NUMA pinning for optimal performance. So there's many criteria for different types of uh, balancing in order to decide which host is the best candidate for migration. So the types of solutions for applying predictive analysis. We have live migration, load balancing, as we discussed, uh, fault recovery, also minimizing the live migration pausing. Uh, we could use a predictive analysis for that as well, and we'll discuss that shortly. Uh, we have uh, redundancy as well, which we also discussed. And we have the distribution of processes that are running simultaneously. So you have duplication, which means more energy uses. And of course, uh, fault recovery uh, for when there are failures, um, the re redundant uh, processes and or host can then take over from the uh, hosts or and or processes that are not responding. So live migration. Well, there are a few things to consider with live migration. Remember, we're migrating a process from a source host to a destination host. So the first thing to consider is the connectivity. We also need to consider the remote disk availability. We need to migrate all of the local disk data from the source host to the destination host as well. And we need to copy all of the memory in phases because first we copy all of the memory content while the process is still running on the source. Then we pass the differences, because remember the process is still running, so it's changing the memory. So we have to pass the deltas, the differences of the memory, until we find the minimum pause time where the differences are small enough to, make, to allow for the process to be paused at the smallest amount of time. Uh, so once we reach that minimum pause time, we then stop the process on the source. We pass the rest of the memory to the destination. We copy the CPU states. Again, the goal is to limit the pausing of the process. 
then we restart the process on the destination host seamlessly, and then we clean up on the source host. So live migration transitioning example. So these are the sequence of events. We set up or synchronize the disk, and we start the memory transfer while the process is still running on the source. We estimate the minimum downtime, and we continue the memory transfer in deltas until we reach the minimum pause time. Then we pause the process, we activate the network on the destination, we complete the memory transfer, and then we run the process on the destination, and then we clean up the source. So live migration from host one to host two transitioning. So you can see here that the guest process has already migrated from host one to host two. But the storage data is still sitting on host one. And so we have two controllers whose job it is to migrate the data in the storage, the local storage, the local disk, from host one to host two until all of the data is passed. In the meantime, if the process needs data that is still on host one, it can obtain that data through the two controllers. So predictive analysis, and these are the topics for the discussion. Predicting future occurrences via analysis of past performance. Well, this is the concept. The techniques for predictive analysis will be discussed, including the process for developing a predictive model, the types of predictive models with examples, and then applying these techniques to scheduling. So this is the predictive analytics methodology. We have historical data, and from that, we extract a training set. We develop an algorithm. The algorithm reads from the training set. It creates a model. We feed in the test set data to the model. We obtain a result. We compare the result to the expected result, and we obtain a percentage of error. Based upon that percentage of error, we then adjust the algorithm, maybe the weights in the algorithm, such as if it's a neural network. And then we do the process over again until the percentage of error is at a minimum threshold that we find acceptable. And that's called machine learning. So there are many techniques for predictive analysis, and I won't go over them all. The key is not to be a solution looking for a problem. You need to define the problem first and then choose a solution that best fits the problem based upon the required criteria. So this is the process for developing a predictive model. We define the project, we collect the data, we analyze the data, we validate the data, and then we create a model. We deploy that model, we monitor that model, Again, we calculate the percentage of error uh, based upon the results against the expected results. And we redefine the project. And then we do the process cyclically. And that's machine learning. So the types of predictive models with examples. But we have support vector machine models. Those are classification models to predict a category. For example, stock prices might increase or decrease is uh, one criteria or one application that we might to want to, uh, to uh, solve. And that's obviously a binary yes or no uh, kind of model. Then we have uh, predict quantity, which is a regression model. Examples can be uh, predicting a person's age based upon their height, weight, health, and or other factors. We have anomaly detection, uh, normal behavior versus exceptions. Those are anomalies. An example could be money withdrawal anomalies. If money is missing from your bank account, that's obviously something that should concern you. Uh, clustering, uh, discover structure in unexplored data. And examples might be finding groups of customers with similar behavior, giving a large database of customers containing their demographics and past buying records. So those are some examples. So for applying predictive analytics to schedulers, 
we have certain criteria for the data that would be required. Uh, we would want uh, to consider processing time and or processing iterations, and that can be adjusted for resource capacity as well as priority. The percentage of resources used, and that could also be adjusted for capacity and priority. And to adjust for anomalies when calculating averages, which we'll discuss shortly. So we can collect certain ideas or selective techniques that have been applied to other scheduling type of applications, such as machine learning and advanced mathematical models. We can consider combining regression-like modeling and functional approximation using the sum of exponential functions to produce probability estimates. And there are many other examples. So here's a predictive analysis architecture. We have the historian and it collects the data from the scheduler. The types of data would be information about the CPU, uh, such as a percentage of available CPU as opposed to total CPU, uh, memory, storage, and networking that can consider not only size, but also throughput, as well as scoring. That data could be collected and placed in the historian. The predictor would then read the historian and create a prediction based upon the data, uh, such as whether to perform a live migration, and then it could send a trigger to the scheduler to do just that. So tracking historical data, what data would be interesting? The time each process starts and terminates for early migration, the resources used by each process, the time each process uses to migrate, and the time and or iterations that memory and or disk transfers occur per size. Considerations based upon analysis. They can be if early migration can proceed, when early migration shall start, and error correction and or anomaly detection for accurate results. For example, anomaly and or error calculation methods to consider in order to gain more accurate results could be statistical, such as calculating the percentage of error from the mean and eliminating results outside of the threshold, it could be one way of filtering out outliers. Signal processing techniques, such as smoothing filters to eliminate glitches. You can even use machine learning techniques, such as analysis of patterns and categorize and to categorize between normal and out of range results. Thank you. Um, I'm open to any questions. All right, very cool. Um, thanks for that, Stephen. So, Hi. so as Stephen said, folks, so we're happy to answer questions now. Oh, yes, he is, and I'm happy to forward them to him. Okay. Uh, yes, I I read uh, Karen uh, Tan question if there's no data, and I covered uh, trying to um, eliminate outliers and there's different uh, techniques uh, that I uh, mentioned, uh, such as uh, statistical uh, type of uh, approaches in order to um, in order to uh, calculate uh, the percentage the mean then uh, to eliminate outliers that are at a threshold. Uh, you could also use uh, machine learning techniques for that as well, because uh, outliers are anomalies. And if you treat them as anomalies, you can filter them out. A signal processing as well, though that might be a lot more sophisticated. Uh, but th the idea of reducing noise is noise is an anomaly. So it's a matter of um, eliminating them and filtering them out. Uh, this way, such as, for example, with early migration, if something failed and the process uh, went down and didn't complete early, so that would be an outlier that you would want to filter out. Otherwise, your results won't be accurate when the machine has to really learn how long a process might take. So I...
Anything else? So, Karen's also asking if the data is open sourced and published somewhere. He'd love to explore this data. Yes, well, the idea of this is there's a few phases with this, and one phase can actually be that you run stress testing uh, against the CPU uh, stress testing, against the memory, uh, networking stress testing, and you can generate the data that way. So we've done s some investigation in that, uh, but we haven't really, uh, had enough resources to really forward with uh, but that's something that we do want to do. Uh, and once we create that data and we use uh, different techniques uh, in order to to do that, we monitor, we would monitor the, the CPU, the memory, uh, collect the matrices. And based upon that, uh, we can see what the thresholds are. And, and uh, by stressing it, you then see where the limitations of the is. And uh, then those thresholds can be used as part of the learning process. Uh, so the first step would be to generate the data. And the beauty of this, this I suppose to most machine learning processes, are first, usually with machine learning, you collect the data first. And with project for the fault tolerance, uh, for the early migration, it would have to uh, really learn uh, and you would have to analyze when the processes went up and down. But for fault tolerance, you can actually uh, use stress testing in order to uh, generate the data, them and then you can clean the data, and then you can use that data for the actual, uh, training. Uh, so uh, I have many ideas in that area where you don't have to, it would take too long to actually generate a fault and it probably wouldn't be accurate. It could fault in different ways. But by using stress testing uh, and um, uh, degradation of performance is just one example of detecting when something might fail. Uh, so actually generate uh, the data in this case. It works well for the, the concept of uh, tolerance, migration for full tolerance. I hope that's clear. Anything else? Uh, doesn't seem like it. Well, again, thank you so much, Stephen, for hopping on. I know it's very late for you. Um, this is some very interesting stuff. Uh, for everyone else who attended, the talk will be published later. Right? It's all going to be available on YouTube. Um, so yeah. Thank you again, Stephen. Hey, Have a good night. You too.